The Beetle Horde, Chapter 2 Beetles and Humans How long he had remained unconscious, Tommy had no means of determining. Of the sun, he found himself lying on the ground beside a shattered plane, his eyes wide open. He stared at it and stared at it upon him without understanding where he was or what happened to him. His first idea, he had crashed on the golf links near Mitchell Field. Long Island, for all about him, were stretches of vermin grass and small shrubby plants. Then, when he remembered the expedition, he was convinced he had been dreaming. What brought him here to a saner view was the discovery he was enveloped in furs, which were insufferably hot. He half raised himself and succeeded in fastening his fur coat, and thus discovered the whole apparently none of his bones were, was broken. But a plane must have fallen from a spiddle height that had been smashed so badly that Tommy discovered he was lying upon its extensive mould of sand thrown up as a some gigantic mould for burrowing tracks run through its very, very direction. It was this that saved his life. Something was moving at his side. His half submerged in sand pile. It was moving parallel to him with great rapidity. A greyish body, half covered with grains of sand, emerged, waving two enormously long tentacles. It was a shrimp, but fully three feet in length, and Tommy never before had any idea that an unpleasant object a shrimp is. Tommy staggered his feet and dropped nearer to the plane, eyeing the shrimp with horror. But he soon was relieved to discover it was apparently harmless. It slivered away and once again buried itself in a pile of sand. Now Tommy was beginning to remember. He looked into the wreckage of the plane. Jim Dodd was not there. He called to his name repeatedly. There was no response except a full, except a dull echo from the ice mountains behind the veil of fog. He went to the other side of the plane. He scanned the ground all around him. Jimmy had disappeared. It was evident he was nowhere near, for Tommy could see the hole of the low scope of the bowl of every side of him. He walked away, or he had been carried away. Tommy thought of a shrimp and shuddered. What other fears of monsters might have inhabit that strongly valley? He sat down, leaning against the wreck of the fuselage, fuselage, and tried to adjust his mind, tried to keep himself from going mad. He knew not, knew now that. The flight had been no dream. He had been, was a member of his uncle's expedition. He had been flown with Jimmy's towards the pole. A crash in a vacuum. But where was Jim? And how were they going to get out of this, out of the damn place? Something like a heap of stones not far away attached Tommy's attention, attracted Tommy's attention. Perhaps Jim Dodd was lying behind that. Once more, Tommy got upon his feet, began walking towards it. On the way, he stumbled against the sharp edge of something protruded from the ground. He cut his legs sharply with a curse. He suddenly began rubbing his chin and looking at the thing. Then he saw what it was, another of the fossil shells, half buried in marshy ooze on which he was treading. The ground in this lower part of the valley was a swamp, and count of very fine mist falling from the cloud clouds that surrounded it impenetrably on every side. Then Tommy came down came upon another shell and another. Now he saw there were piles of what the had been taken to be rock everywhere, and that was not this was not rock, but great heaps of shells, all in creakly intact. Hundreds of thousands of prehistoric beetles must have died in the valley, perhaps overcome by some capitalism. Catalism. Tommy examined the heap near which he stood. He yelled Tom Dodd's name. But again, no answer came. Instead, something began to stir among the heaps of shells. For a moment, Tommy hoped against hope it was Dodd. But it wasn't Dodd. It was a living beetle. 
a beetle fully five feet high, as stood erect, a pair of enormous wings outspread, and a head was large and a man's, was the most frightening object Tommy had ever seen. Jim Dodd would have said at once this was one of the curial of stout beetles for a progulation of the head. Between the eyes formed a sort of break of the foot, a beak of foot in length. The mouth was open to downwards, was armed with terrific mandibles, while the huge compound eyes looked like enormous crystals of clucked glass. Originally in front of the eyes are two mandibles, as long as the man's arms, with feathery processes at the ends. In addition to these, there were three pairs of legs, the front pair as long as a man's, a hind pair, of as long as a horse's. Paralyzed with horror, Tommy watched the monster, which had apparently been disturbed by the vibrations of his voice, and extracted itself upon from among the shells. Then, with a bound that covered fifteen feet, had lessened the distance between them by half. And a still more amazing thing happened: for a sudden, a hard shell slipped from the thorax, the wing cases bumped off, the whole of the bony pot slipped to the ground. The clang of soft, defenceless thing went slivering away among the rocks. The beetle had melt, had molted. Tommy dropped to the ground in the throes of violent nausea. Then, looking up again, he saw the girl. She was about a hundred yards away from him, very close to the fallen plain. She must have emerged from a large hole in the ground, which Tommy could see over, uh, under a ledge of the overhanging rock. She seemed to be dressed in a single garment, which fell to her knees and appeared to fit tightly about her body. But as she came nearer, Tommy watched her, petrified by the latest apparition, discovered that it was woven of her own hair, which must have been of immense length, for it fell naturally to her shoulders, and that thence was woven into a close, close fitting material, a fringe of inch or two length extending beneath the savage. She was about six foot tall, apparently made after the normal human pattern. She moved with a slow, majestic swing, as ever any female had seemed to Tommy to have the appearance of an angel. This unknown woman did. She was so fair, in that flossy, flaxen covering, she moved with such easy grace that Tommy, gaping, gaping, gradually crept nearer to her. She did not seem to see him. She was stooping near the very sand heap into which she had fallen. Suddenly, with lightning like rapidity, her arms shut out, her hands began tulling in the sand. But cry of triumph, she pulled out a shrimp. Tommy had seen a lover like it, and stripping it off the shell, began devouring it with evident relish. In the midst of a meal, the girl raised her head, looked at Tommy. She saw her eyes were filmed, vacant, dead. Then of a sudden, a third membrane was drawn back across the pupils. She saw him. She left the shrimp drop to the ground, uttered a cry, and moved towards him a tottering gait. She groped towards him with outstretched arms. Then she was lined again with the membrane, once more covered with her pupils. It was that as if her eyes were unable to endure in the dim light of the valley. Though... Who's those surrounding mists, the low sun settling just above the horizon, were able to diffuse itself, save the brightening of the fog curtain. Tommy stretched, stepped toward the girl, his outstretched hand and touched hers, in unquestionably a woman's hand to be held, he held, delicately warm, with exquisitely moulded fingers. In those touch, the touch was seen to be the girl's more tactile impression of him. Again, the membrane was drawn back with the girl's pupils for a fleeting flash. Tommy saw two eyes in intense black, their colour contrasting curiously to the flackened colour of her hair and a white skin, almost the tint of her beanos. Their eyes, eyes had surveyed him and appeared satisfied. 
that he was one of her kind. She could not have seen very much of almost instant flash of vision, clear that membrane, since he had been used to living in the dark, if the full light of the day was unbearable. She drew her back the hand away. Far vocals came from her lips. Suddenly she turned swiftly. She could not have seen, but before Tommy had seen, she sensed the presence of his old man creeping out of the hole in the man's side. He moved forward cruffily, then pounced upon the snail pile. In a moment, and pulled out another of the savage shrimps, which proceeded to devour with a greedy relish. The girl, leaving Tommy's side, joined him in a most unpleasant feast. In the midst of it, a flood came pouring out from the hole, a flood of living beetles, carrying around in fifty-foot leaps as they dashed at the two. To his horror, Tommy saw Jimmy Dodd among them, wrapped in his fur coat like a mummy, being pushed and rolled forward like a football. For a moment, Tommy hesitated, torn between its solit- solitude for Jimmy Dodd and that for the girl. Then, as a foremost of months of bound for a side, he ran between them. Vicious jaws snapped with six inches of Tommy's face, a force that would have carried away an ear or shredded a tree. If they had met, Tommy struck out with all his might. His fist clanged on a resounding shell, so the blood spurted from his bruised knuckles. He struck the monster squarely upon the thorax. He did not dis- con- con- condoned it in the least. Turned on him. His glassy manifested his eyes, glaring, cold, infernal, lightly lights. Tommy struck her again with his left. And this time, upon the fleshy pulp of the downward opening mouth, an inch higher he would have been pelled his hand upon the beak. A point like a needle and eventually used for purposes of attack, since it was not connected with the mandibles. The blow appeared to fall in the only vulnerable place. A monster dropped down upon its back and lay there unable to reverse until its antenna, forelegs waving in the air, rear legs rasping together in a shrill, strident shriek. Instantly, Tommy darted out of the way. A swarm fell upon this helpless monster began devouring it, tearing its strips of flesh from the lower shell, which in space of a half a minute drew simply to a bone. The most horrible feature of this act of cannibalism was the complete silence which its performance, except, except for the rasping of the dying monster's legs, is evident the huge beetles had no vocal or apparatus. For that moment left unguarded, Jim Dodd, Flung upon the collar of his fur coat, stared about him and recognised Tommy. Oh, my God, it's you, he yelled. Why are you, cannot you? He had no time to finish his sentence. A pair of antennae went round his neck from behind. At the same instant, Tommy and the old man and the girl were gripped by the monsters, which forming a solid pelix about them, then began hustling them in the direction of the hole. Resistance was utterly impossible. Tommy felt as if he was being pushed along a moving wall with stone. Inside the opening it was completely dark. Tommy shouted to Dodd, but the strident sounds of the moving legs drowned his cries. He was being pushed forward into the unknown. Suddenly the ground seemed to fall away beneath his feet. He struggled, cried out, felt himself descending for the air. For half a minute he went downward, speed at constructed throat, so he could hardly draw a breath. Then, just as he ner- nerved himself for the immediate crash, the speed of descent was checked. Another moment he found that he was slowing at standstill mid-air, beginning to float backward, upward, but the wall of moving shells pushing against him, forcing him on, downward, yet apparently against the force of gravitation. Then, of a sudden, Tommy was aware of a dim light all about him. His feet touched earth, 
grass is softly as a thistle down, alighting. If I instead of seated in the same dim light under red grass and staring into Jimmy's face. <laughs>